This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those who like to make and drink great beer. A quick reminder before we start this episode to help the recovery and rebuilding of the craft beer industry, we're awarding $100,000 in free advertising to 20 worthy businesses and causes. Applications are due by April 7th, so visit beerandbrewing.com slash grant for more information. Now, on to this week's episode, which was recorded about a month ago before social distancing and shelter in place were in effect. Welcome to the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, co-founder and editorial director of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, Jamie Bogner. I'm here in Richmond, Virginia today, sitting in uh, the original brewery for Hardywood Park, uh, one of the uh, long-standing craft breweries here in Richmond, Virginia. My guests on the podcast today are Kate Lee, VP of Operations and Quality, and Brian Nelson, VP Head Brewer and Engineer for Hardywood Park Craft Brewery. Welcome to the podcast, Kate and Brian. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Cool. Uh, we went through our Brewery Accelerator event here in Richmond over the last four days, and uh, Kate and Brian were both uh, fantastic, valuable uh, uh, professionals contributing to our panel discussion and the learning for breweries and planning. And watching you guys in action over the last couple of days, it was like, gosh, we really should do a podcast. And uh, so I appreciate you all joining me on the podcast today. Before we talk about your entree into brewing and the kind of history of brewing, nearly 2,000 breweries across the U.S., Canada, and Mexico partner with G&D Chillers. Innovative modular designs and no proprietary parts propel G&D ahead as the premier choice for your glycol chilling needs. Breweries you recognize like Russian River, Ninkasi, Jack's Abbey, Sam Adams, and more. Trust G&D to chill the beer you love. Call G&D Chillers to discuss your project today or reach out directly at gdchillers.com. Also, Old Orchard invites you to step up your fruit game with their premium craft juice blends. Whether you're planning a passion fruit kolsch, conquered sour, mango lager, or other fruity brew, Old Orchard can supply you with consistent product at affordable prices. Their blends are packed with real fruit and natural flavors with no added sugar or other weird fillers you'd find in knockoff brands. With the rising demand for fruity seltzers and brews, the time is ripe to grow your relationship with the right juice supplier. Get your Old Orchard sample kit today with a free six-pack cooler at www.oldorchard.com slash brewer. So Kate and Brian, walk me through your histories in brewing, how you got where you are here now with Hardywood Park Craft Brewery. Sure. I guess I'll go first. Um, So I have been with Hardywood for about six and a half years now. Um, we've been open, we're on eight and a half about right now, um, years, uh, as far as we've been open. I have actually been in the brewing industry, um, for about 20 plus years. Prior to this, I worked at Anheuser-Busch, um, and moved around to four different locations. I started with them in Fort Collins, Colorado, moved over. Congratulations, my hometown. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Woohoo. Um, went to um, Columbus, Ohio, Merrimack, New Hampshire, and then the most recent being Williamsburg, Virginia, where I was their assistant brewmaster down there. Yeah. Um, met Eric and Patrick and just fell in love with everything that they were doing, um, everything they stood for, the community that they were involved in. I actually have my degree in food science from North Carolina State University, so this is completely you know, applicable for everything that I actually learned in college, which my parents are very proud. Um, Nice to know that their money is going towards a good thing. Uh, But this is pretty much all I know um, is making beer. Cool. Yeah, yeah, a little little bit different path for me, but uh, we ended up in the same spot. Yeah, so I, I, uh, out of college, a mechanical engineer, worked in the automotive industry. Um, Ironically, we were in Columbus, Ohio, Kate and I, uh, I think probably living at the t- same time there, but yeah. never actually met each other there. But uh, it took us to get to Richmond to, to meet each other and work together. But um, cut my teeth on uh, commercial brewing in New Zealand. Uh, my, my wife and I moved down there for almost two years um, after I decided to uh, call it quits with the automotive industry. Um, you know, again, related back to parents at that time, my father thought I was crazy <laughs> trying to get into the brewing industry. Uh, but it was something, something I was passionate about, a home brewer um, at the beginning. And and um, you know, just trying to work my way up the ranks. Worked with uh, Galbraith Sale House down in Auckland, New Zealand, and um, you know, try to go and visit as many uh, Southern Hemisphere breweries as I could while down there. And, and brought that knowledge back to uh, Richmond when my wife and I moved back. And at that time, um, Eric and Pat were setting up shop here in Richmond. Um, so I kind of just made a cold call to them and and uh, made a relationship with them. Did some pilot brews, and they decided to hire me on as uh, first first employee and first brewer. 
it's funny because the story of the founding of Hardywood Park in some way, uh, you know, references that uh, Southern Hemisphere, uh, you know, trip that uh, Eric and Patrick took and that where it hit them in their revelation. And now you come from that same kind of uh, spending time down there. Yes. Is that you're on brand as a hire? <laughs> okay. I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> so talk to me about the beers that Hardywood is known for. You know, what uh, what, if, what does Hardywood stake the claim on? And, uh, and then maybe we can talk about how those beers that you've envisioned as a beer program have uh, developed over time. Yeah, I mean, I think the way we can start that one is uh, gingerbread stout. I think that's probably what Hardywood is known for, or at least what we have been known for in the past. Wow, when we first staked on a pastry stout it, of yeah, some sort. And, and, okay. and back in, you know, when we first released it in 2011, um, it was kind of an idea that was uh, foreign, certainly to me as a brewer. Um, you know, the idea of, of adding, you know, some of these ingredients and um, trying to trying to make it relative to, or at least taste like a, uh, you know, gingerbread cookie kind of sure, kind of thing. Sure. So, but it really, you know, that, that, um, you know, out of the gates, uh, hit pretty hard in the, in the market we were in, we were one of three breweries at the time in Richmond and absolutely, um, pe- people were standing in lines and, you know, that yeah, whole thing where, sure. which, which we don't find much anymore as far as our right, beer releases right. and we're fine with that. Um, but that was one of the beers that kind of, you know, struck us as, uh, at least put us on the map for, Hey, we gotta, we gotta come see these guys. Yeah. I remember the first time I heard about that beer, I was actually talking to Kim Jordan of uh, New Belgium for a pick six story in Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. This was a lot of years ago. And uh, she mentioned Hardywood uh, Gingerbread Stout. I'm like, oh, okay, that, that sounds interesting. I had to look it up. but uh, And then realized that it was this phenomenon down here and you make barrel-aged versions and everything else. Um, what was the genesis of that beer? And I mean, obviously those were early days for these beers and certainly there were brewers that had to have turned their nose up at some idea of something like a gingerbread uh, cookie beer. Of yeah, course, now was, now all of that seems quaint because you have does. other brewers that are you know putting actual Oreos in their beer on a regular basis. You know? And I, I think during that time as well, you know, in 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 2011 and, and moving into 2012, it was kind of that open open market. For, certainly for us, we were we didn't have a tap room at the time. We could always serve samples out of our tap room, yeah. which was an interesting thing. We just always opened our doors as a wholesale or you know to, to sell to wholesale. Um, and that was one of our first beers that really vanished, and everybody was looking for it after that. And um, yeah, that those those types of days may not be uh, quite you know here right now. Uh, should be in, and certainly for you know our market here, our home market in Richmond. Um, you know, I think we service what uh, we have forty two breweries or something in the greater surrounding area. So it's a lot of great beer. Uh, I mean that and that's that's the great thing, and it's trying to keep up with all the all the new breweries uh, is the plan. Sure, sure. Talk to me a little bit about building a spice character in a beer and then working on how you incorporate that spice character, uh, how you make the selections of spices in order to achieve that, what that kind of process and design looks like. Because, you know, you've done it with gingerbread stout and you've also extended that idea to other kinds of, you know, spiced stouts in a similar kind of family. Uh, But using spices can be a very difficult thing to do, getting them to integrate well into a beer, uh, getting the beer to, you know, getting them to extract properly into a beer, uh, controlling some of the kind of drying and, uh, you know, uh, phenolic properties that some of these spices can have. Um, And, you know, at the same time, simple ingredients like cinnamon can vary wildly, you know, between types, between vendors, even within the same type. Um, talk to me a little bit about that kind of ingredient, uh, you know, testing validation, um, you know, and then, uh, you know, figuring out how to properly get the flavor you're looking for from those ingredients in some of these big beers. Sure. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll uh, probably talk a lot long, <laughs> a long time on this and Kate chime in, please. But yeah, we've, uh, you know, when we originally uh, conjured that spice profile, um, it was just bench top testing, you know, taking yeah. some beer off and some growlers, aging them for, you know, especially on the vanilla bean side or the cinnamon for a certain period of time. Um, it was between cinnamon sticks versus, you know, some ground up cinnamon. Um, it was all, you know, fresh ginger, I think was the key to this. And we had uh, a relationship we forged uh, with a local ginger grower here in Virginia that does, you know, baby Hawaiian, you know, ginger grown, mm. grown in high tunnels out in Powhatan County. Um, which he he was, he, he was uh, uh, came up and cold called us as well and said hey can you do anything with this ingredient and that kind of sparked off you know some of the initiative to make a gingerbread stout using local ingredients um, which is a challenge in itself um, you know figuring out the levels of of in, of you know the spices and, and the vanilla bean and the honey that we've added to it was something that we did bench top but actually getting it into a uh, format where it's 
able to go into beer and to keep it clean and shelf stable and that sort of thing has been challenges. You know, we've struggled with that, I think, from the inception, yeah. Talk to me about those challenges and what you guys have done to address some of those challenges. Yeah, so I mean, you hit the nail on the head when you had said that it's very difficult to integrate some of these things. It's also very difficult to keep consistency from year to year. Yeah. Um, we use actual ingredients. We don't use flavors in our gingerbread stout. Um, so we're using whole vanilla beans. We're right. using actual hands of baby ginger. Um, so. You know, differences come every year with whatever type of environment or weather conditions we had for that year. So we're constantly reinventing, I'll go ahead and say the recipe, hmm. to remain consistent. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you have to continuously taste and test and bench test. And one thing that we have learned, especially moving to our larger brew house, is that not all gingerbread stout is created equally, meaning just because we brewed it one way here at our original location doesn't mean that it was necessarily gonna come out exactly the same at, a, at our new location. So that was a, a How huge much work and how much change did it take when you moved those, you know, that recipe and that process, not just from brew house to brew house, but also tanks to tanks, you know, using different tank geometries, using, you know, you know a, a different approach to even uh, that kind of blending and fermentation. We, I think in uh, 2018 was probably the first year, okay, but I'd yeah. say we did not do a good job of that. Um, you know, getting the flavor profile from the, la you know, getting that essence of what we wanted gingerbread stout to be um, started at the brew house at the, in the mash mixer, right? And, and this was scaling it up from a 20 barrel uh, recipe, which our 20 barrel brew house is pretty rudimentary. You know, it's, 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 um, it was an old NSI, still is an old NSI system, but uh, nothing fancy on it, just single infusion. Yeah. Um, you know, the lottering was only sized for probably, you know, 12 to 14 Play-Doh beer, and we're trying to throw something out there at 20, 21 Play-Doh, right? So um, that was a mash ton that was filled to the absolute brim, you know, in the 20 barrel system, but we were only collecting, uh, it evolved to only collecting about 17 or 18 barrels in the cat. Oh, actually, I'd load in that probably mm -hmm. 15 barrels in the kettle um, and then having to do that multiple multiple times in order to fill up a 120 barrel fermenter right yeah, yeah so those those were the challenges but that's what actually you know we, we just determined that procedure that process was what made that beer um, at our original location so uh, maybe a little overconfidence scaling it up to uh, the 60 barrel you know we we apps when we moved into the new brew house it's an automated system it's a 60 barrel brow con system um, had really good success with pills our german pilsner you know our belgian blonde our richmond sure, lager sure. all these sort of things that were like oh this is great um, so a little bit of overconfidence in that uh, in that first uh you know, fall to winter in brewing gingerbread stout over there was was a challenge and, and the biggest learning curve that our brewers and myself, you know, just a tweak in the recipe over the time over that period of time um, was probably uh, what we needed to do, but we probably should have you know looked at it more closely and done some test batches before then for sure. Yeah, so 2018 gingerbread stout season was kind of like our our huge awakening yeah. that we needed to get it together. Um, so really, I was mean, it the uh, untapped reviews uh, or it, consumer, it was, yeah. it was, I mean, it was internal. Okay. We internally were sure. well aware that it wasn't exactly where we wanted it to be. It's not like we needed somebody to tell us sure. that. Sure. Um, but you know, we had kind of reached the point of no return. It's not, it, it wasn't awful, but it's just, I mean, it's an incredible beer and, um, right. it wasn't as incredible as we knew we could make it. So we literally went into 2019, I say like January 5th. And we sat down as a group and we had many, many intentional meetings, intentional tastings, intentional bench testing um, starting in January throughout the year, making sure we were all on the same page, testing different types of cinnamon, testing different um, types of vanilla, meaning the whole vanilla bean or pre-ground or grind it ourselves or vanilla powder. Um, and, you know, making sure that we made those decisions based off of what created the best beer, um, which didn't necessarily mean it was the most inexpensive or the easiest sure. way to sure. process it. So um, going into 2019, this past gingerbread season was a huge um, turning point for us. Um, we really kind of became very humble with the beer. And quite honestly, I think this is the best year we've ever released. Um, we also do 11 other versions of this beer during that time. So um, it was a big success for us this year. And that's how we're going to continue moving forward with yeah. that beer. Um, 
how do you build this idea of what gingerbread stout is? Now, clearly you have some sort of uh, ideal of what it should be, but what it should be is not just quantifiable data that you can measure against. Some of what it should be is how that pulls together and, and impacts people. And so it becomes this kind of mix of soft skills and sensory and articulation and that kind of data piece as well. How, how do you build a, something like a brand standard for a beer like that that has such you know, a complex ingredient profile? It's one thing if it's the four main beer ingredients, right. then the data points really align pretty directly with, is this the beer that we want? It's a whole other thing when you start talking about year-to-year variation in the, wrong, uh, the other adjunct ingredients you know, and spicing and, and whatnot that you're pulling into a beer like that. Uh, how do you do that? And, how, and then how do you, you measure against that standard that you create for the beer? Yeah, and that, that's, a, that's a difficult one because, there, you know, we've, we always reminisce back to the original, you know, that's that's the best it ever was, it ever could be. Oh, I, you you know, mean batch one batch was better? Batch one, yeah. Batch and, one was and, always better. And always better. And that's, that's what's resonating in our customers' minds, too. Yeah. You know, oh, remember that time? And sometimes it's the atmosphere. Sometimes it's the, you know, that whole package together sure, of when sure. it was released and seeing those big lines and people coming out for it. I don't think the, you know, the the other, uh, you know, beer releases were, were uh, any worse or, you know, better. Some of them we did know we were like, ah, maybe not quite to brand. And that's kind of what we call it now is, 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 is that beer to brand? Um, and that's kind of a, a, when we get new team members on at brewers or, you know, in the quality side of things, it's, it's, a, it's evolving because you're bringing new faces, new flavor profiles that they have and they want to see in that beer too. But you always have a, you know, a, a sort of a core, core standard we set um you know as a management team and the brewing side we have to be like all right well this isn't this isn't the brand let's try to do a little bit better you know what what else could we do to you know have uh have these ingredients these special you know really expensive and sort of very specific ingredients you know the decisions we've made over the over the years sometimes financially with using some vanilla powder which is just ground up vanilla bean it wasn't the the uh the consistency and the quality of those bourbon madagascar vanilla beans which cost about three hundred dollars a pound. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure, sure. So you know, we, you know, we, we're not we're not shy in saying that, and not certainly not shy on using them. But, um, but yeah, yeah. It, the, the, those those decisions, I think, for this specific beer is like we're going to try to brew the best beer we possibly can, and and that's the that's the philosophy behind it. Right so now. where does this to brand idea exist? Is it a collective general agreement between people? Do you have some parameters that you define it with? Is it a you know combination of data and language? This is not, you know, the, this if I, if I were to taste this and it were not to brand, you know, who makes that decision? Who holds that idea of brand? And how do you kind of define and articulate that? Sure. So true to brand is what we call it, and we're far from the only brewery oh, sure. that uses sure. true to brand. But quite honestly, it is somewhat new of a term for us. Um, just within the past two years, we started basing our sensory analysis or our sensory panels that we do on a regular basis off of, is this true to brand? So we're growing that um, that term and what it means for us. But yes, ideally, internally, we decide as a production team what true to brand is. And it's really all based off of sensory. So that includes visual, that includes mouthfeel, that includes taste, um, the entire experience of drinking from start to finish. The data analysis that comes in um, on the quality assurance side of things is certainly important if we find that something's not true to brand, but ultimately it's all based off of the sensory experience. So we have a full description of what a beer should taste like, whether it's our Great Return, which is a West Coast style IPA, or our Pils, which is a German style Pilsner. We, we know what they're supposed to taste like, um, and we can put numerical values to that as well as a go, no go. Um, is it true to brand? Sure, is it not sure. true to brand? And then that's when we can start digging into the actual data that we collect on that beer to understand why it's not true to brand. Right. Flaws are easy enough to, to find generally through data and also through trained sensory people. You know, it's that harder question of does, you know, does the way that these bad, you know, the, this uh, lot of hops that's in this batch actually align with what our vision is for the, you know, for the brand that becomes a harder kind of problem to, to kind of, you know, go to. Yeah. That gets down to this training employees so that enough people 
hold that idea of brand in their palates and in their brains. Yeah, we, yeah, we don't want to, you know, our brewers or anybody on our, our team be a, a robot and just kind of go through and say, oh, this is beer, we package it, or this is uh, beer, we brew it. Um, yeah, they, they have to be looking at the materials coming in, uh, the ingredients, tasting it all the time. Uh, Kate and I taste beers, you know, daily just to make sure that we're sampling them from start to finish um, to make sure there's nothing and there are two brand, you know, so when we get the finished product to get the, the thing, you know, the beer in the bottle, we taste it and we're like, oh, yeah, it's great. Um, but yeah, there's quantifiers that are coming through on DO levels, you know, which we take, you know, and, and Brighton package, or we want to make sure those are uh, as low as possible. And those we have some numerical or at least guidelines for, for all of that in order to make that shelf stable and make sure our customers are tasting the beer that we want them to, to taste. Sure. I will go ahead and say we do so much analysis throughout the entire process where we run in the lab, we're taking pHs, we're testing sure. for any kind of microbial growth within the beer that could cause an off flavor. But in all honesty, it comes down to how does the beer taste? And if all of your numbers are good and your beer still does not taste what we'll call true to brand, then you have just as serious of an issue if you got a positive beer spoiler organism found in your beer. Uh, that's an interesting point. I would love to also talk about how that idea of true to brand may shift and alter over time because of other flavor inputs that everyone has. Before we talked about that, though, uh, this episode is brought to you by Hopsteiner, your premium hop supplier dedicated to delivering quality hops and hop products in every package. Visit hopsteiner.com for a complete list of offerings or select shop hops to start ordering today. Also, Fermentis is the obvious choice for beverage fermentation. They've provided the beer industry from large and small breweries to home brewers with the best fermentation yeasts since 2003. Their yeasts are easy to use. Just pitch your Fermentis yeast directly into your wort. No rehydration necessary. To learn more about how Fermentis can improve the quality of your fermentation and for the latest on their exciting new product releases, visit Fermentis.com or visit them at the Craft Brewers Conference in San Antonio, booth 8071 um if the craft brewers conference actually happens <laughs> so. and uh, we should know by the time that this podcast airs but we are there is a little bit of lead time there um that idea of true to brand and what you envision for the brand certainly also is not impacted just by the beer that you make but also everyone's palates you know uh, all of our palates are impacted by everything that we taste whether it's a new coffee drink from Starbucks or a new dessert that Whole Foods Bakery puts out or anything along those lines. And so, you know, as new flavors of cinnamon and vanilla or new ideas of richness or, for example, in the beer world, this increasing arms race towards adding, you know, higher and higher final gravities to these beers uh, that help bring out some of these kinds of sweet flavors, um, you know, some of these things shift and move over time. Mm -hmm. You know, for you all with Gingerbread Stout, I imagine when you launched it, it was probably a little bit drier beer than it is now today because palates have shifted. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but how, you know, talk to me a little bit about that process of both engaging with the broader world of taste and how that can impact the idea of what this brand should be. Yeah, yeah, We're going to get deeply I, philosophical here. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it is certainly customer-based. If I had to remember back to the original beer that we brewed, especially gingerbread stout, it probably was just about as sweet as what you know last year's version was, where I think we hit it right on the, on the head. Uh, again, to accept those, you know, uh, to have enough body, but not not be so sweet that it's cloying. But to ex also accept those, you know, those spices well, and, and to sort of meld together. Um, you know, we've done some ridiculous things uh, recently on the brew house uh, in kind of a you know a lot of these things happen by uh, maybe just a little happenstance or chance or or uh, you know I think it and this one where we blew, brewed a forty Plato starting gravity beer. Uh, intended for barrels it was supposed to be around 32 33 to really bump up the uh the starting gravity um so you I, some accidentally my, got my to brewer, 40 play well, my, my brewer <laughs> how does someone me? accidentally I get know, to 40 I know, right? I may have been having a couple beers that night. I was at home, <laughs> and uh, my brewer, we were doing our we were doing our cassowary base, which is our imperial milk stout, um, and we got a really really good runoff from it, right? And we were collecting what we do on this beer um, just because we want to concentrate those sugars and, and get it a high high gravity starting, which is not easy on any 
brew house. It's certainly not any easier on a uh, automated uh, system either. So we're taking kind of first runnings off of it and collecting them. And right. we collected uh, two rounds of that and uh, had really good uh, runoffs on it and uh, boiled down really hard in order to get that 40 Play-Doh. And my, my brewer that was there at the time, because uh, it was a long evening for him, he said, what should I do? I said, well, let's just roll with it. You know, let's, let's go and see what happens. Ferment it out. Uh, I mean, obviously yeast can only do so much so sure. it, it finished at a very high gravity uh in in there and we were like well what are we gonna do with it now it's obviously not drinkable on its own um but we put it into some wood casts some bourbon barrels some apple brandy barrels and are letting those be in and they absolutely are the best blender mm-hmm. uh barrels so we take those it has just such a richness and we've had we have them over a year now mm-hmm. is that yeah so some of them are aged over a year now and we kind of sprinkle them in, in our, on our barrel blends just to kind of yeah, uh, yeah. flesh things out a little bit give a little bit of chewy to it, um, some more richness, and that's it, been, I think, one of the uh, the best non decisions, I guess, or accidental decisions I've made uh, in a while. Cause, and, and, and you know, they're they're aging extremely well in the barrels. If we taste them, they're again a bit too cloying to, to drink on their own. But you know, it's something you could utilize in your having your tool cabinet. It's so. funny you mentioned that because I had a great conversation on the podcast with Jim and Marty from Revolution, and they said the exact same thing. I had a I had a batch that uh, uh, went bigger and then and finished higher and put it into barrels and found that there was a different aging character in the barrels that came from that extremely high gravity beer. It's nothing you ever want to drink as a single stream beer. Right, you know, right. it's only there for blending, but that it captured a different aging, you know, character oxidized in a really pleasant way mm-hmm. over that kind of time. And it's interesting that you're finding the same thing here that that becomes this stock. Now we've yeah. we've leveraged off that too and done some um, barley wines recently. That was a, a, a six hour boil on it to reduce it down to a, a real high gravity in order to do the same thing to have another blender barrel. Um, that we just kind of keep on hand. We're going to keep for a while and see how it ages so that we can make these, you know, epic, you know, barrel blends. And, and that, that seems to be, you know, our customers love them. I mean, we have a, a group that's um, what we call our family tree, which is our beer, you know, uh, uh, club uh, that, yeah, that they just absolutely eat those things up and, and are willing to, uh, you know, pre-purchase and do all these things that are fun for us because we know exactly what to brew to. We can sure, hand, hand sure. select barrels. You know, it's, it's, it's one of these things that gets our brewers uh, super pumped. These barrels are almost like an ingredient for us. That sure. If we want to push a beer over the top, we know we can use one of these. Then um, you tap into one of these blender barrels that are just going to do it, and they're going to make it something super special. Mm-hmm. Um, and so does, have you brewed that again to put some more into barrels? Yeah, now, no, yeah, we, we spent now all Now it's of, intentional. Huh? <laughs> now it's intentional. We've spent all of January of this year kind of uh, loading up on some cool things. We got some... Um, uh, Tomcat gin barrels too. That's just going to be fun. That we put some uh, a rye wine in and a wheat wine in just to kind of see how that goes. And so we've we've been you know barrel aging for us is. Uh, um, evolved over the you know the course of the years we've been open, but now it's kind of just all right. We we have this really really good stock and really good base beers. Um, you know sometimes very simple malt bills, but they just evolve in the barrel, and that, that's what gives them their character at the end. Talk to me a little bit about that malt bill, malt bills for some of your big big stouts. Sure, yeah. I mean for uh, for our cassowary um, imperial milk stout, it's it's heavy on chocolate, a little bit of black patten. Um, you got some crystal one twenty, crystal medium. Uh, we're partial to Simpson, so it's seeing a little bit of crystal extra dark in sure. there. Um, flaked oats for sure. Um, and then kind of finishing off, I think that rounds it out as far as that goes. But it, heavy on lactose, I mean, it's, we're, not, we're not shying away from there, but it's not, it's not immense. You know, heavy on lactose. You know, it, it's, yeah. not, it's not immense in there, but we use a, a fair amount of um, uh, lactose in there in order to give it that, you know, kind of creamy and sort of figure out. Sure. And, and water salts. You're calling it a milk stout. Wa- you know. water, water salts have been kind of what we've been focusing on lately, too. Okay. Um, you know, the, a little bit of calcium chlorides in there in the mash um, and some sodium bicarbonates as well in order to give it some some body and some give that caramel flavor kind of passing over into the into the water and into the boil but yeah for first first uh runnings off of that so we're not you know diluting with any sort of sparge water because we don't sure. have a um, we're not building our water profile bulk it's all you know becoming in the mash uh, mash water that we're using um so that, that those are the techniques that we've been uh i guess we've 
you know learn to evolve on on the bigger size brew house that we do and just kind of using it as 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 we would on a uh yeah our 20 barrel where we're just taking first runnings off that and not really using sparge because our mash ton was absolutely undersized that kind of thing sure sure let's talk a little bit about uh incorporating fruit into stouts you know that's an interesting one obviously you have raspberry stout which is a pretty big brand for you all uh, you know, over the years, I've had interesting fruited stouts. That's not a major category by any stretch of the imagination, um, but your, the flavors do seem to work because chocolate and you know berries always seem to work together as that kind of flavor. Um, talk to me a little bit about integrating fruit into these big dark beers and how you build recipes to benefit from that and then build a process so that the fruit can actually express and not get just completely destroyed by the big flavors that are in that base beer yeah and it, it is a, it is a balance and and some of that you know for instance our raspberry stout it's um we use a local uh, uh grower for our, our raspberries too which makes it that much more difficult this was back in our early days when i when we were doing these you know uh local fruit beers um raspberry stout's been around for you know years now sure, and, sure. and still yeah it has a great following um but scaling it up was always my uh, sort of concern of being all right we're not just using a couple pounds here and there we're using 2500 pounds of fresh local fruit um how do you how do you deal with that and you know luckily we get we get um the the fruit maker or fruit grower will actually get it de-seeded which is important we've done it both uh, both yeah. ways with seeds and de-seeds it has to be de-seeded because it, it stratifies within the fermentation uh, side of things you have seeds float to the top and you have this big mess as you're transferring afterwards the other uh, very difficult thing, again, if you want a clean beer, is to uh, pasteurize the fruit. So we've done a few, you know, double boils and kegs. We've done a, a lot of different methods of, of trying to heat that up to make it safe for the beer. What we've uh, finally kind of resolved itself, I've relegated, um, you know, some three-barrel fermenters just to fruit processing and fruit heating. So it's a small heat exchanger. Uh, we run steam in the steam in the jackets, the huh. cooling jackets okay. around there on, under under zero pressure. So it's that atmosphere. So you have any, don't have a, uh, any issues with that. But then we just rotate that with a little bit of beer mixed in in order to. Um, just heat it up to 140 gourmet huh. gourmet pasture what we call gourmet pasteurization so get up to a safe enough level we do check on uh, uh, our process a longer amount of time obviously yep. if it's a, just yeah a it'll be it'll yeah. be it'll be yeah t- 20 to 30 minutes um you know we have worked with you know bring it up to 160 but you know the the temperature range can go to 170 where you start to destroy some of right, those flavor right. compounds you want to have in there sure um and then push it into the the bulk you know 120 ferment you know barrel fermenter in order to, to referment out so raspberry stout uses 14 pounds per barrel huh. um of, of that's fruit. a cheap beer <laughs> our, our our peach triple is even uh beyond that it's it's around 48 pounds oh per barrel God. um which is yeah it's a, it's a tough tough thing to do but um that, that's kind of what keeps that that series and that um uh, where's your cfo where can we get them on this uh, <laughs> on the podcast we don't let him yeah. comment <laughs> <laughs> Um, I will say another thing with the fruit. I mean, yeah, we absolutely love our fruit, um, but we don't introduce it into the process until secondary fermentation. So we allow the beer for the most part to completely ferment out. Um, oftentimes we'll pull some of the yeast off of it at that point so that we can utilize it for a reharvest um, and then introduce the fruit that Brian was just speaking of. Micro testing all along the way to ensure that it right, is clean right. before we actually put it in. But that really helps um, maintain the flavor that you're actually getting from these fruits instead of just being a simple sugar that those yeasts can ferment out. And so there is not a re-fermentation that happens in there, your... There is. No, that oh, there absolutely is, is. Oh, okay. yeah. And so, I mean, that's it's a pretty quick ferment. I mean, the amount of sugars from the from the fruit, typically, I mean, the, the our peach triple, we, the amount of fruit we do add to that takes maybe a few days to, to get down to terminal. But um, yeah, that, it's one of the most important things is actually making sure, and it, I don't know if it's a, um, we've had some theories on this that have never been sort of confirmed, but the yeast has already finished what it's needed to do with, you know, simple sugars within the, the malt, you know, and everything right, else in right. the wort. And then it kind of converts over into, oh, what's this new sugar that it's encountering um, and gives a, a much better profile than you would add mm-hmm. adding it directly to either a kettle or, you know, Whirlpool or, you know, trying to trying to pasteurize it then. And that goes for any honey that we use. Um, it's digested a bit differently from huh. the yeast that we found. The flavor compounds stay in there um, of honey. So you give a much richer uh, you know, with during post fermentation, sure, a much sure. richer uh, feel to these fruits and 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 honeys and other fermentables in there. 
which is great because as much as you're spending on honey and some of this fruit, like yeah, exactly. losing that flavor, we know it's, we know it's is, going to a good cause, right? Making the just, beer better. Yeah, heartbreaking. So no, that's that's a that's an interesting idea. Let's let's shift gears and talk a little bit about some of your other beers. I definitely want to. Maybe we'll talk about pills and the iteration of pills for you all. Uh, but before we do that, this episode is brought to you by Brewers Publications, publishers of Small Brewery Finance by Maria Pearman, How to Brew by John Palmer, and the forthcoming Historical Brewing Techniques by Lars Marius Garshall. Established in 1986, Brewers Publications has published more than 50 books of enduring value for amateur and professional brewers alike. Visit brewerspublications.com today to browse the complete catalog of books and ebooks. Also, our own Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine's all-access subscriptions give you a year of the print and digital editions of the magazine, plus access to our library of video courses, a special deep dive email only for all-access subscribers, premium content, and all-access exclusive merchandise, which I happened to design myself. Go to beerandbrewing.com and click on the subscribe button to join now. Uh, yeah, I am also our graphic designer and uh, brand guy for Craft Beer and Brewing. In addition to many hats you wear, many hats, small business. You know, we you you know the drill. Yeah. Um, so we're drinking some, we're pouring some pills right now. Uh, you know, this evolution of lager in the world of brewing is uh, is becoming a thing. Um, so why don't we talk about, uh, you know, number one, is it real? Number two, well, no, I shouldn't say that. It is real. We are, we are looking at the numbers. We did an article in the New Brewing Industry Guide where we're looking at the IRI numbers. And I think the growth rate for Pilsner is 18.9% over the trailing 52 weeks. And the pale lager is an 18% growth rate. The two of those together, or separately and together, are by far the fastest growing craft beers. In terms of overall volume, they're still relatively small. Um, but their growth is outpipe, outpacing IPA even, which you know, it's an interesting one to see. Might actually be the time for lagers. Um, talk to me a little bit about Hardywood Pills, the formation of it, uh, and how it has evolved uh, since you started making it. Yeah, it, this this one, um, tackling it, uh, you know, it's obviously a very technical beer. Um, it, it doesn't uh, hide any flaws, and you have to have it absolutely right. And, you know, one of uh, you know, bringing Kate on early, in the early years, just just before this started brewing, yeah. you know, with her experience at Anheuser Busch, you know, did help us as far as getting the the right profile and the right time. You know, recipe development. We did some pilot batches of it and wanted to go true true German. You know, you know German Weirman pills, um, a little bit of Weirman's Carafoam, um, some acidulated malt, and then going into German uh, uh, Hautauer Blanc or hard sorry Hautauer and Pearl and Tetnang and just going sort of classic German style on this and kind of a Southern German uh, style uh, beer is what uh, my uh, my friends at Braucon when they came to commission the brew house you know so, sort of figured you know like oh this is more of a Southern German I'm like well you guys must. Know, but they really, really, really dug it, which was a good, uh, a good indication that we're doing something right. But you know, the evolution of um, you know how we brewed it here at the original brew house and how we're doing it now. I mean, there's some step mashing we're doing in it now just to kind of get that extra added uh, protein rest in there. Um, but and, and, and overall, the and I'll let Kate talk about the fermentation profiles on this because um, again, that was early on very important to us to get right um and that maybe you know the expertise of me at that time was wasn't quite into the lager area it, there's a kind of a rustic character to it and a richness that is not just the clean and crisp uh you know kind of northern german bitter pills it's uh you know almost a, a rustic yes, malt yeah. character to it that I find endearing. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about that fermentation process. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you're correct in the malt profile. And we also have the bitterness dialed up just a little bit more than a traditional style um, Pilsner. But this beer was certainly a challenge for us when we first started. Uh, we had only done ales up until this point. Um, we had a brewer at the time who was extremely passionate about lagers, and he was amazing at what did you say? I said, give him the plug. Yeah. Ken Rare, you're awesome. Um, um, and extremely passionate about brewing lagers. Sure, and so he was, sure. he, he and I worked a lot together on how to get this beer to ferment as cleanly as possible. And what we learned about this particular yeast is that we know nothing about yeast. <laughs> um, what, what yeast every, is this? So this is, this is a traditional German lager yeast. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, it's 
very different than the ale yeast that we use. Um, we also have a very complex yeast management program. We do not have one lager strain and one ale strain or one stout strain. We introduce many, many different types of yeast into our system. Right. At one time, we typically have about six or seven strains potentially going at one time, Yeah, 22 plus throughout the year. Um, we pride ourselves on using the yeast that we feel is the best for that style of beer. If we can reuse some of the yeast, we will, but we certainly don't rely on that. How do you that. manage that? I mean, that gets expensive for a production brewery gets to very be expensive. buying pitches all the time. Um, Are you built, you know, propping up and uh, you know, kind of growing your own yeast? What does that system sure. look like? So for? we do purchase the initial cultures of all yeah. of our yeast. Um, we have an incredible quality assurance manager, Zach Simoncelli, who has taken over the yeast management program for us um, since being at West Creek now. And he's got a very complex job. Probably one of the most important is keeping these little guys happy. Sure. So sure. we will buy pitches and we do have a propagation tank that we can grow up those yeast to sizable pitches that we need to use at West Creek. Um, but again, each yeast is not created equally. So it really takes um, a lot of time to get to know each of the strains and understand their resilience or understand how they like to be treated, understand what they like, understand what they don't like. I mean, you truly begin to develop, this is sounding so ridiculous, a relationship with the yeast. Um, you just get to They're know it, you know things. what it looks like, like yeah. you know when it's happy, you know when it's not. Um, it's, it's, it's really, it, you really have to become very passionate about the yeast and that is how you can manage a complex program and and Zach has done an excellent job and and we will continue to do that. What are with. some of the things that uh, you didn't expect that uh, you know that managing this yeast uh, forced you to learn? Um, we didn't we didn't have accurate pitch rates at first. Okay. Um, so there was that. We found that we weren't able to get up to the generational targets that we wanted. So typically we try and hit 10 to 12 generations on our yeast harvest. Right. We were getting to two or three and this yeast was starting to just kind of like putz out on us. It, it wasn't happy. Um, so we found that particular yeast rates uh, were extremely important to us. We also found um, how to oxygenate this beer, um, whether you're using sterile air, or sterile air or oxygen. At the time when we created this beer, we were just using oxygen. Um, having the correct um, oxygenation um, levels in the beer uh, were extremely important. And then a lot of this was uh, two brew days. So how much volume we put in initially versus how much volume went on top of it in the second day was also extremely important. Um, so it was really just understanding how to pitch the yeast as well as what temperatures to hold everything at, a diacetyl rest, how long the diacetyl rest needed to be, ensuring that everything was cleaned up throughout the entire aging process of the beer. Uh, we've gotten to a point now where we've pretty much got this nailed down um, to a schedule and, and, and it rarely creeps out of that schedule, which is fantastic. That's exactly where we want to be. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit too. We mentioned, uh, you know, I don't. I'm sure other breweries do this as well. But uh, you know, what what we had learned for just getting bigger and bigger tanks in, in our original brew house was, you know, either we brew uh, four times a day or six times a day, whatever it was, or we split it up in three and three or two and two, so two one day, two the second day. But actually, you know, it seemed to help our yeast growth, yeast uh, uh, profile, and and you know, kick in fermentation in a, at a quicker rate. Um, that was something we didn't do in the past we bought a pitch for a 40 barrel turn we did you know two turns in one day uh, it was a long day and you know after a while it just made sense to do that but it actually helped us learn a little bit more about the yeast i think yeah we so, actually use two times as much yeast in a lager pitch as we would in an ale pitch all right and so are are you doing the back day-to-day -day brews now or are you doing both brews in a single day and then pitching everything. Yeah, but most of the time, most of the time, depending on depending on the beer and how much uh, actually yeast we, we may have at the time. Uh, but you know, our three hundred sixty barrel fermenters, we're, we have to break it up into two days. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we'll we'll do three turns and three turns, and that just you know makes and sense. And you'll pitch in day one, and that correct. initial you know brew will actually help prop that yeast. And, so and then when sometimes you, on yeah. our bigger bigger stouts, uh, we may do some additional aeration on the second day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
let's uh, let's change gears again because uh, you know as, as interesting and fun as Pilsner and Lager are, uh, a lot of beer fans these days are still drinking IPAs, and you all have gotten into that hazy IPA game. You certainly make a few other brands that are more classic in style, whether it's the VIPA or Great Return. Um, that have a little, I guess you call it West Coast or American, you know, style IPA profile, um, you know. But you're entering that hazy IPA game and kind of playing with fun labels and kind of creative flavors. Let's talk a little bit about your entree into that world of beer and uh, you know and h- how you have moved through it. So we have what we call fresh can Fridays. Um, A lot of that is revolved around these hazy IPAs. And the reason we do that is because that is what our consumers want to drink. And um, ultimately, at the end of the day... uh, What percentage of it is, you know, brewery uh, volume, would you say? uh, Yeah, I I would probably say, I mean, if we're doing uh, a fresh can of of IPA, you know, hazy sort of side of things, uh, it's not that much, maybe 500 barrels a year, 300 to 500 barrels. It's not as much as, you know, again, we talked about lagers earlier, but, you know, our Richmond lager, which is American craft uh, lager, we, we sold 300 or sorry 3,000 barrels last year so the the disparity between that and hazy's for us is is a little bit different than i think a couple other breweries six but. to one for yeah. richmond lager <laughs> yes. over over hazy ipa okay there there's hope for the future right yeah at least, I mean, at least and i joke i love hazy ipas and i don't think that they're yeah i, I love drinking them um there's that there's that super certain brewer the curmudgeonly brewer that would love the fact that you're selling more uh, richmond lager than ipa yeah i mean we certainly want to include ourselves in as many different categories categories of beers we possibly can, but we also yeah. don't want to spread ourselves too thinly. We sure. don't want to be everything to everyone, right? Um, so, But we want to have a little hand in introducing these types of things so that we can remain relevant, innovative to the growing and changing customers that we have. So Fresh Can Fridays is our way to really introduce hazy IPAs as well as other very creative beers, we're starting to see that there's a desire to have something else other than that. So we're we're starting to do. I know there was a conversation last night when you guys were in your panel about milkshake IPAs. So we've we've done a couple of those. Um, we're looking at introducing. What else are we doing now in fresh cans? We're, we, we're, I, I think it's one coming up again. And this, I'm going back to loggers on this, but we're doing a Italian pilsner yeah. coming up in a fresh oh. can, and I think it's gonna so hit the nail right on the now. head. It's gonna be yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, so we did a pilot of that. Um, I had my uh, brewer Jeff uh, go through, and uh, and he's like, "Hey, can I do this on the pilot system?" I'm like, "All right, yeah, go ahead." And it turned out fantastic. So I can't wait to see what you know what the bigger scale does for this beer. And um, you know, the malt bill is very exclusive. It's using some Weirman's malts that we don't use very often, and uh, um, you know, tailor made for for an Italian pilsner. So it's gonna be awesome. So I'll ask you know, I talked to uh, Chris Johnson at Green Bench about that idea of Italian pilsner. You know, a few months ago, um, for you and Italian that Italian style pilsner, I, I find it incredibly compelling. Alvarado Street's Paleo Italian style pils is one of my favorite beers of last year. Um, how do you define? parameters for something like Italian pills and how do you then design a design a yeah, beer because no, uh, I mean it is question. such a loose and amorphous idea <laughs> yeah. um, you know and I've had some you know we've, uh, we're obviously our next issue of Craft Beer Brewing Magazine is the our lager issue and so we've been receiving these have tasted some interesting and good Italian style pilsners and um, won't get into who they are you'll have to read the next issue of Craft Beer Brewing Magazine Ooh, to see, see how they go um, but you know but from your perspective as a brewer how do you build parameters around this thing that doesn't really exist as its own style and just has some ideas right. and general concepts around Yeah, you know, and I'm the first one to admit that I don't drink Italian pilsners all the time, but it's one of these things. Who, who, do who does? If you who don't, does, yeah. So, if you don't but, live in Italy, but, we can't get there now because with, it's all quarantined. <laughs> yeah. But what this, uh, you know, this the pilot brew that we did brew, it was one of these things that was just nice and bright and clean and absolutely pale. Um, and it was just, it had, you know, a level of carbonation that was appropriate, you know, just to kind of sparkle in there. So it was nice, clean, and it kind of finished almost immediately. So you wanted to have more. Is yeah, that, that, yeah. that was the kind of feel for it that I got. And I was like, oh, this has some, this, this has something to it. Um, and it is, it's got some, you know, some, the hop character that it, uh, we have in there is going to have some lemon qualities to it. So it's nice and bright. Um, I, I don't know, we're, we're, we're 
we're we're kind of uh, yeah doing this off of a whim, but it may have some <laughs> legs after after we have it to you know our customers taste it, and we're like, oh man, that that's that's a, that's a fridge beer. We need to definitely have that. Sure, sure. And somehow we got sidetracked to talk about lagers instead of hazy IPAs. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Get some brewers in a room, and there it goes. Well, I will say with our Fresh Can Fridays, the other super fun part about it is the labels that we have. So they're all in 16-ounce cans. Most of them are only available in our tap room. So it's really a way for us to keep continuously pulling our customers back into our tap room to keep interest in coming back. We have so many great tap rooms around Richmond, um, and we want people to continuously keep coming back to ours as well as right, Richmond. Right. Um, so it's kind of our way to come in, naming these beers, the art around some of these labels is the most fun part about what we're doing with these. I, I think an interesting, I'm going to go off subject again, but uh, th- <laughs> interesting thing about like, you know, we're talking about hazies and, that, and that's the, you know, the IPAs being one, one of the, the higher volumes in general, but uh, I always go back and always have this argument with our, uh, you know, there. it's not an argument, but it's just like kind of a <laughs> statement saying, <laughs> guys, our number one seller in the tap room is always our uh, single, our Belgian Blondale. By far, every weekend, week in, week out, it doesn't matter. And Pills is second. And then, you know, so Richmond Lager, I think, will be we, – we actually have not launched that in draft yet. Um, so 3,000 barrels worth of American lager uh, just in the market, and our tap rooms have been in bottles and cans. We're launching it in draft coming up in this uh, next week. But uh, that is going to, uh, I think, be a game changer for us and hopefully the industry-wide, at least in our local market. But, uh, but yeah, Belgian Blonde. Uh, highest selling uh pint in our tap rooms and uh, don't we don't see that out in the market <laughs> but we certainly see we certainly see it in the tap room it's such an and that's such an interesting dynamic for every brewery and we see that you know quite a bit that there are different types of drinkers that are attracted to the brand you know and so the different types of, of you know, the types of beer that certain drinkers are attracted to tend to sell more because there is that kind of beer drinker that wants to try a little bit of everything and they are uh, uh, freelancing all over your your beer menu in order to try a little bit of everything that's their adventure you know some kind of approach to craft beer and then there are beer drinkers that find something they like and they just want to drink a lot of mm-hmm. that one thing. Yep. Yep. And so something like a single or a pills become th- those tend to be styles that those that type of drinker who finds what they like and know that they like it and just want to drink that are they're perfectly fine with that. Single was also the very first beer that we made. Right, right. Um, so it Stalic. is a little nostalgic sure, to a lot of sure. our original customers and we talked about gingerbread stout being something we're very well known for. Um, Single is also, again, our number one beer um, as far as from day one. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit, though, about that, you know, hazy IPA process. You mentioned Fresh Can Friday, but Mm -hmm. let's talk about what you've learned through the process of uh, working through figuring out this beer style and, uh, you know, trying to scale it up to a reasonably large scale production, which you do. Um, Yeah. 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 That's it. It, We did. We did struggle with it. I, I, I totally agree with that we we tried multiple different things different yeast strains different uh dry hopping schedules different you know just only whirlpool or no whirlpool at all you know what what are we going to do is it going to be a zero ibu kind of thing or is it going to come out uh we we worked through a lot of a lot of different brands um in in a pilot or put them into a can uh or just on draft to kind of figure out and navigate that you know do we have uh some yeast settling out that really shouldn't have been so it could be does not be long it does not become a hazy anymore you know and and what that using higher protein, you know, malt contents in order to, to, to retain some of those uh, characteristics that uh, are known for it. Um, I think now we've got at least our process or at least some malt bills and, and things uh, dialed in, you know, pHs in the mash tun are, are crucial for us. Yeah. Um, and then moving into the kettle too, to make sure that's all, you know, adjusted properly. Um, but then beyond that, it's, it's kind of where I'm at on these is, is kind of, adding some different hop varietals in it. I'm kind of getting over just the Citra, the Mosaic, you know, the yeah. Galaxy, the Nelson, the, all these things that we see the all the time. The Easy Button Hops. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's great. And they make great uh, the Hazy IPAs. But, you know, I think I mentioned this in the panels. And last night was using some Bramling Cross in there. Put a th- in, This is one we just were drinking earlier, that Triadic, that uh, 
threw another dimension in it, um, in my opinion, and I liked it. And, and uh, I was talking with our brewers the other day. He's like, yeah, you might be something on there. And no, nobody's using Bramling Cross anymore for just about anything other than maybe some red IPAs or some uh, uh, ESBs or no, things like that. No, but I have, you know, we have been having that conversation. I've had some really interesting beers, and Outer Range is one of them, Willows, uh, mm-hmm. you know, where using – uh, English hops and yeah. using some of these more traditional hop varieties in a mix with you know right. some of these other hot hops kind of creates a I mean number one you're not paying <laughs> uh, yeah. Nelson or Galaxy yeah. prices you know for this complimentary hop but at the same time there's this interesting herbal sometimes minty sometimes woody you know kind of character that some of these classic hops can bring to some of these which again, used as a component of that overall hops mix, kind of makes them interesting and makes them fun to drink, yeah. especially for those of us who have drunk a ton of these <laughs> kinds of beers. Well, they all start to kind of be in this and, similar in profile, right? I you know, you like you just start craving something that's a little bit different, yeah. and I, you know, I want to find some edges in here that uh, are something to latch onto that aren't just that Citra Galaxy or yeah. you know. Uh, Citra mosaic, kind of right down the middle, juicy, fruity. What I expect. Which are delicious, but They're yeah, just kind of yeah. Something nothing wrong with those it, yeah. at all. But sure. obviously, you've got this desire and demand from consumers to produce different iterations of these things. And so, in order to do that, you need to you know take some experience. And there is this wealth of hops out there in the world that you can call upon that Absolutely. are you know to kind of create that how do talk to me about that process of evaluation and even thinking about this you know and so um yeah how do you build a blend like that yeah i mean you have to go at least i do go go back to those individual components of of what that hop may contribute you know we've you you don't want to blend too much because it'll get muddled up. But, you know, kind of that three hop blend, I think, is where I'm going to start going towards is, is having a citral component, especially this last beer we did um, with Triadic was, you know, the Brandon Cross brought this like black currant sort of dark fruit component to it, um, but finished up kind of citrusy and kind of with that orange peel kind of kind of feel to it. But so that that's that's the combination. And it's 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 knowing. Um, you know, obviously hops from batch to batch or from crop to crop are going to change a little bit, um, over the years, but, uh, yeah, kind of getting a, all right, well, we, we, we've used this in that beer with a similar malt profile, you know, we've used this in that and kind of coming up with a, with a good blend. I think we're decent at it. Um, there's always room to improve, but yeah, just smelling them, opening them up, smelling them. If we have the hop, you know, uh, when we have some vendors come by and, and, and show us some experimental hops, we're like, oh, that's really cool. But what beer would that go well with? You know, right. do we have do we have anything? Do we have a vehicle we can put that in where you know where it's going to actually translate to uh, being a, a great great IPA? Um, and on the hazy side, you know, just try to find that yeast strain too that's that's providing the best benefit as well. Um, and we've we've gone through a bunch of them, mm-hmm. a bunch of them. Mm-hmm. Did you settle on anything? Uh, we've settled on several because that's how <laughs> several. we several. <laughs> That's you are co pitching some yeasts into <laughs> these aren't hazy ideas. We are co pitching. We, we just yeast. don't use one type of yeast for all hazies. Oh, okay. okay. Not all hazies are created equal. That's um, so, for yeah, sure. you know, 50% hops. And I do know plenty of brewers right. that are actually pitching multiple of, you know, yes. of these yeasts in yes. order to kind of accomplish what they want to accomplish. But So, we've used Conan yeast. We've used London Ale. We've used right. Kavik. Um, we're, you know, we're all over. And yes, we have settled on certain strains for certain hazies. Um, sometimes when it's new, um, we use what we have and c- create a recipe around that yeast strain. Um, each do act very differently within their profile that they have. Right. I think the biggest challenge when we started this, the tropication was our first attempt at a hazy IPA, which, which to this day is not even a hazy <laughs> IPA because it totally so went, it dropped yeah, out and it, went it, like, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. yeah. So, which is great. Tropication is a great beer, no longer a hazy IPA, but that's when we said, okay, we're going to enter this market. We're going to do this. And I am going to go ahead and say right now, our first brew, it was here at our original location. It was, I mean, the brew went great, but the fermentation was kind of a disaster. Like we put so many hops in it and all the yeast and we didn't know how to make it hazy and we couldn't figure anything out. And I'm sure there was a time, I gosh, I think there was an actual Instagram picture of me like filtering hops through a coffee strainer i shouldn't air my barrel like you know dirty laundry here yeah, but uh, i think we put like something like seven pounds was, per barrel in the dry right. hop which was kind of fun kind of fun and interesting to figure out but maybe not maybe not that much it was it was bad it, um but it took a long time for us to really learn how to not make clear beer 
Um, that's sure, all we really sure. knew how to do, especially myself coming from Anheuser Busch. I'm being tasked with one. You it's know, what making, the East wants to do too. I right, mean, just, right. You know, right. even London Ale Three. I mean, you know, if 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 the mash isn't right, then right. It, it will still go clear. I mean, it's just what it wants to do. Right. So um, we've gotten much better at it. And um, yeah, the recipe yeah. development with our brewers and what Brian put together is phenomenal. And yeah. we've got our yeast figured out. As we typically close here on the podcast, we talk about, uh, you know, what success means for a specific brewery. You know, for both of you that have been here at Hardywood for a number of years, talk to me about what success for this brewery looks like. Uh, obviously, expansion and change and growth have been a constant for you all. Uh, you have multiple facilities here in Richmond. Uh, you had, a, had I guess, now one in Charlottesville as well um, that doesn't exist any longer. You know, there, there's a dynamic uh, element to this market that you all are constantly responding to. Um, but what does what does success look like for Hardywood Park Craft Brewery? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll speak personally on that. You know, I've been, you know, the first uh, employee and, and was very lucky that uh, Eric and Pat, you know, hired me on to do that. And success for me, looking at each day, is, is there's always something to um, create or uh, try to innovate to, to, to build. Um, you know, again, you mentioned going on, we are doing some facility changes and, you know, we went through a, a two year build on a bigger facility and, and, and working out the kinks on that. And that, that's, that's the fun part. I mean, that's, you know, as far as I'm concerned, when, when, when we try to motivate our team, um, to, for an initiative, it's one of those things you look at it. Here's the target. Uh, do we actually hit it or not? Maybe sometimes not, mostly not, you know, that's, that's all part of it. But, but do, but do, we, but, but do we try? Yeah. Do we try? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I don't right. think there's one thing where we could say uh, we've, we've uh, really failed upon. We've had some brands that haven't hit the mark. We've had some beers that maybe weren't so great. You know, we've had our struggles with gingerbread stout, uh, but coming back from that and, and making it, you know, again, what we try to strive to do is make the best beer in the world. Um, and, you know, that I think getting, getting the feedback from our customers, you know, awards is one thing but that's not what we hang our hat on it's it's more feedback from our customers and making sure that um you know we're, we're always always moving forward into a, a new direction um barrelage too i mean we see you know we did almost twenty thousand barrels last year i don't think that's the benchmark we're trying to say you know we were successful if we hit the twenty five thousand or thirty thousand or a hundred thousand um i think a sustainable company is what we're looking for um, and it's tough in the brewing industry this year, uh, and it, in the upcoming years, I'm sure it will be as well. Um, but that's, yeah, I guess, I guess making us that, uh, happy employees, I mm -hmm. think is another thing. Mm -hmm. Um, we try to, we try to do, and, and, and again, it's an always evolving, you know, task to, to make sure employees sure. have a good place to work and, right. and it's healthy environment. It's clean. It's, it makes them motivated too, to, to, to help, help the, the greater initiative out. Hearing more and more of that, you know, as, as breweries, it's not just about achieving commercial success. It's also about achieving a sustainable environment that includes that employee health and that employee well-being. And uh, it's, I think, a sign of maturity in the brewing industry as we get past just doing cool things um, and just being, you know, hot where people are going to line up for our stuff and get into the how do we make sure that everyone is benefiting from this and the people we care about that we're working with, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um you know, as far as success, um, in my eyes, is obviously you've got sales numbers, and those things are extremely important. Um, and we want those to rise, which is, yes, of course it's success. But that alone is not enough to define success for any of us. Um, success, quite honestly, is us having a very passionate team. Um, we want people, like Brian just said, to be very happy coming to work for us. Yeah. And a lot of that involves the visitors in our tap room, the consumers going to their local local grocery store and purchasing the beer, and having these experiences and these memories and these moments that they can actually pair with being in our tap room or drinking our beer. Right, it sounds right. so ridiculous, but quite honestly, we don't wanna make anything that doesn't provide benefit to people. So to be able to have passionate employees, seeing other people be passionate about, passionate about the moments they're in and the experiences they're having, that is success, is having those customers continuously coming back 
um, and being able from both sides, back of house, front of house, customers, just everybody enjoying the product that our employees are working so hard to produce. Sales success means that what you're making is resonating with customers, you know, and so it's not just about making more money. It's you're doing your job and providing people with those experiences if they're buying your beer and enjoying well, that beer. Right. And, 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 and we're very fortunate that there's so many local breweries in, in so many different states, sure, especially sure. here in Richmond, doing wonderful things for their yeah, community yeah. and for the people that live here. And so we just want to remain relevant in that experience. It's a good place to end it. Uh, nearly 2,000 breweries across the U.S., Canada, and Mexico partner with Chandy Chillers. Old Orchard invites you to step up your fruit game. Hopsteiner is your premium hop supplier. And Fermentus is the obvious choice for beverage fermentation. This episode is brought to you by Brewers Publications, publishers of Small Brewery Finance. And, of course, Craft Beer and Brewing's all-access subscriptions are the best way to support this podcast and support Craft Beer and Brewing. Uh, Kately, Brian Nelson. Hardywood Park Craft Brewery. Thank you for joining me on the podcast this Thank week. you for having us. Thank you so much. Yeah. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew.